Today, uh, Amwal Mag welcomes Amadou Diallo. Uh, he's the CEO of DHA Global Forwarding Middle East and Africa, a division of Deutsche Post DHL providing air and ocean freight forwarding services. It also plans and undertake major logistics projects under the brand name DHL Industrial Projects. Amadou leads a team of nearly 4,000 employees and is responsible for the performance and long-term strategic development of the unit. Amadou, thank you very much for taking the time and joining us on Amwal Mag. Thank you. Very humble to be invited by you. It's an honor and a privilege. Thank you. So we've been, since the beginning of uh, this year, through a, a major disruption and crisis uh, in terms of supply chain, economy, and everything has been turned around with uh, COVID-19. How have you seen this impact uh, supply chain, uh, logistics, and the movement uh, of merchandise and the flow uh, that you, you, how did it change compared to usual? Well, thank you very much. So as, as you know, Deutsche Post DHL is an organization of uh, over 550,000 employees uh, that has existed since 1490. Uh, that means we have gone as uh, through our history, throughout our history, through many different pandemics. And, and this is the new one that we have to face in our generation. Um, so, you know, having been working in the organization in Europe, in Asia, uh, in Africa, and now in, uh, in, in, in the Gulf, in the Middle East. So we have gone through many different challenges, but in, in, in general, you know, in logistics, um, in order for us to keep goods flowing, and that is extremely important uh, because logistics was declared an essential service in many different markets and countries. Um, there are many things that are important, but the first one that is important is that we are still able to connect our people, uh, our employees. So, you know, we have a network that operates uh, across all countries in the globe. Secondly, what is important is that we are able to connect with our customers, um, you know, and uh, to connect with the customers physically, you know, has been a challenge at the beginning of COVID because many countries went through lockdowns. Um, thirdly, we have to be able to cross borders because we're connecting people across countries. <clears throat> um, and, you know, we know that customs processes have been challenging in many different areas because, you know, our governments are people and sometimes they react with a little bit of panic. Some others are a bit more posed. Uh, some have technology, some have less technology. So that has been a challenge that we have to face. And, and lastly, we have to be able, after we have connected and then arrived to places where we have to do the deliveries, be able to handle uh, our shipments or goods in, in terminals or warehouses and do the last mile distribution. And when we're doing the last mile distribution, we need trucks or vans or you know many different tools to be able to deliver to the final consumer. And because most of us you know, were locked down for quite a while, uh, so people requested goods that used to be delivered into shops or into the warehouse distribution to be directly delivered to their houses. That is why there was uh, somehow an explosion of what we call e-commerce uh, demand. Um, but secondly, you know, because we had a huge catastrophe in terms of, you know, be preparedness to resist to the virus. So, you know, we had a lot of uh, personal protective equipment that need to, needed to be brought to people who needed it. At the beginning, it was needed by our friends and colleagues in China, particularly. And, uh, you know, moving forward, then it was highly needed in Europe and in the US and in, um, in the Middle East and Africa region. So, and because our job and our purpose is connecting people and improving lives, you know, we have been connecting first uh, our people in China and trying to save lives there. And then afterwards, we were connecting our people in Europe or Middle East and Africa or the Americas to do the same thing. And all of us have been working jointly with our customers but we also have been you know, collaborating with uh, you know, different government authorities because you know, it is always a collaborative approach in order for us to make sure that people were getting essential goods that they needed. So it was a challenge, but it is not a challenge that we could, could not overcome. Interesting. I mean, we see that uh, COVID-19, we're saying that it accelerated or acted as a catalyst in the digitization and the change uh, in the way we work, we've seen it. Uh, in the work from home, you mentioned the e-commerce. Uh, supply chain is still considered an analog, let's say, uh, business that is ripe for disruption and for innovation. Uh, how do you see uh, your group moving forward on this particular line? What type of innovations and where do you expect 
the biggest innovation to take place? Is it uh, in the tagging? Is it in specialized logistics such as cold logistics or other? Where do you see, or traceability for that matter, where do you see innovation being the most needed and how do you see it uh, uh, take place? Thank you. It's a very good question. So, you, you, you know, um, you know, our population in the globe has, you know, grown quite substantially since a number of years. You know? So I remember, you know, when we were over 10 years ago, when we first, as the PDHL, installed our first innovation center, um, it was mainly driven by two different things. You know, the first one uh, was that, you know, we have an increased number of customers. You know? So we have, we had 700 million new consumers in China, 600 million in, in the ASEAN market, 400 million new consumers in, in Africa, and uh, 600 to 7 million, 700 million in India. So there was a huge demand for us to rationalize the way we propose our logistics solution so that we can cater for the demand that was increasing. So, and in order for us to do that, we will have to go back to technology because at the same time we were challenged by how do we make sure that our supply chain solutions are sustainable in terms of, you know, making sure that the environment is not destroyed. So this is when we, uh, you know, that was our, our first strategy before the, our 2025 strategy. Um, and the 2025 strategy was uh, branded uh, delivering excellence in the digital world. Why? Because, you know, all of us, I mean, the next generation of, so our kids and their friends and uh, potentially the, our grandkids um, are all growing in a very technological uh, era and they use digital technologies. You know, all of us have kids that are using PlayStation all the time and all these tools. So they are not used to the analog way we have been working in the past. You know, I, I'm, I'm putting myself in that generation. So there's really a need of change of working processes for the next generation of workers that will be coming. So, and for us to be able to cater for those talent to come and work in our organization, we have, we have to modernize our way of working. That is the first thing. The second thing, because of the explosion of internet and the, you know, the availability of all the technological devices that now we use everywhere, um, you know, people are less used to going in and sitting on a big computer and logging in, you know, all these gimmicks that we had in the uh, late 80s and early 90s. People are using more adaptive technology, so, you know, we all use our smart devices. So therefore we have to adapt to making sure that people get the information that they need on their smart devices, like for any other source of information that we need to, to share. And, and similarly, you know, for their engagement with our organization, uh, we had to push for those technologies. And that is something that we started quite a while ago. So I, as I said, 10 years ago, we inside our first innovation centers uh, in, in, in Troisdorf in Germany. So now we have the set of innovation centers that have been put in place in Singapore, in Chicago, and we see uh, further expanding that. Why? Because we feel there is a need to use much higher technology because our demand as consumers are totally changing. So our demand as consumers, so you or me and uh, everybody else, now, nowadays we want to be able to sit in Accra and order some clothes that are coming from New York and get them there in three days. So, and in order for us to cater for that type of needs, uh, we associated with uh, an organization called Mall of Africa, for example, in, in Africa, to make sure that consumers in over 34 countries can order the goods, you know, digitally, online, and they get them as you would get them in Dubai or you would get them in Germany or in New York. So that is a new uh, demand that was accelerating. Now, what COVID has done, it has faster accelerated it because people when people were obliged to sit at home, that means that they had no opportunity to go to the shops and all this stuff. So there was a higher demand for, for, for e-commerce solutions. And for us, it meant nothing else than accelerating our 2025 strategy, which is around you know, putting digitization at the disposal of people in order for us to be able to cater for that. Now, with the increasing number of people that are demanding, you need more than just digital platforms. So, you know, you need artificial intelligence because it's a lot of transaction that needs to be processed. And we cannot just, you know, use people sitting in offices because nobody is sitting in offices. Therefore, we have to use a lot of technology in order for us to be able to predict, uh, to, to organize pricing and engagement with the customers without having physically people sitting and then doing all of these transactions because it's just too, uh, a lot of transactions. And certainly because we want to become more efficient, um, you know, we started organizing, for example, uh, in our warehouses that we use robots uh, to clean the warehouses, you know, uh, 
you know, we all want to have clean places. Uh, but as much as we have smaller robots that we're using in our houses, now there are larger robots that can actually do that type of activities. Same is for all these measurements that we do in airports. You know, we have uh, smart devices that can do shipment measurements without anybody going there and doing analog work. So there's a lot of technological innovation that have been put in place now with IoT, you know, which we have been testing five years ago in Hungary, you know, where we are trying to connect different things. So you connect information on a shipment with the information, uh, with the pallet that is moving the shipment, with the truck that needs to move the shipment and to have smart warehouses that, where all this information is gathered. That's something that we have put in place. Why? Because, you know, it will be extremely difficult if you are living in Germany. I understand you have been living in France. You know, it will be very difficult if you are in France to find somebody who finds it funny to sit in a warehouse and then start scanning all of these uh, uh, in our new generation where actually everybody is using smart devices. You, so there you are men a lot of like you mentioned that. Africa, you mentioned Africa and there's a, it seems to be a commitment uh, not only to uh, support e-commerce, but to support locally. So could you tell us more about why it is important for, for you also to help develop local uh, digital communities in Africa? And could this be replicated in other regions? Yes, uh, th thank you very much. So, you know, uh, I, I come from the south of Senegal. I come literally from a village, yeah? So, and I have had the chance to work in Germany, in Marseille, in the UK, in Singapore, now in Dubai, in many different places. So I can see what technology can help. How can technology help our people in, our, in, in the African continent? Because I'm still a, a, a proud African, yeah? So, and what we have been doing in the past, we were working with the World Trade Organization, with an uh, organization called Entrasen, <laughs> and we were trying to help small entrepreneurs in Cambodia, in Vietnam, in Ethiopia, in Rwanda, to be able to have a choice of who they want to sell their goods to, uh, which means uh, that we were working to give them opportunities to sell their goods, not only in Cambodia or in Ethiopia, but also to come in Zurich and sell their goods, or to go to Germany and sell their goods. Why? because if they have much more demand, they can leverage and make much more profit. And that enables them to get out of poverty and without depending on aid. Now, uh, recently there is an initiative that has been launched, it's called Go Trade. Mm -hmm. And the Go Trade initiative where, you know, it's roughly around a 30 million commitment, 30 million euros commitment of over the next 10 years. It is to make sure that small and medium entrepreneurs that are operating in emerging markets, so this case, for example, in Africa, but it is also for people in Asia and in Latin America, that they can participate to global trade. And it is important for us because if they participate to global trade, enable manufacturing of fashion goods or any other product, then it will make sure that if I want to have an Amadou, next generation of me, you know, sitting in my small village in the south of Senegal and then wanting to participate in global trade without leaving my village that I have the opportunity to use technology to be able to reach out to you. Uh, Khaled, you know, if you are in, in Dubai or another Khaled that is based in Lebanon and exchange with them goods without me leaving my village necessarily because now we have technologies that enable us to do that. And DHL is at the centerpiece of it because we try to connect the Amadou that is sitting in Kolda with the Khaled that is sitting in Beirut and make them do business without them having to leave their places. Because all of us, you know, we travel and then have been disrupted historically, you know, to move in different places. But nowadays we also like to do business out of our own places and see our own countries also emerge. And that is what DHL is trying to do. Excellent. And so, uh, I mean, this goes with, there's, you know, the pandemic that we've been living through uh, all together has also brought uh, to the forefront on, uh, let's say, the SDGs theme and how do we make this economy uh, more uh, fair to everybody and what has been called as the Great Reset and how uh, do we uh, engage with all stakeholders and change the views uh, around uh, economic performance, I would say. How, how do you see, because the more we move forward, the more we notice, and what you were saying is that the preeminence of platforms, but also the importance of supply, supply chain. And uh, we're also moving at the same time, having major platforms that are taking bigger chunks uh, of the economy and of commerce and of trade, uh, such as Amazon or, or, or other. And so in your view, what can you do to 
uh, empower more and what do you do? What is the program to support uh, a broader vision with a stakeholder approach uh, of the economy? Well, so, you know, I also had the chance to go in San Francisco and visit some of the technology friends <laughs> um, with a lot of my colleagues. So one notable difference that we have compared to only technology companies is that we are a technology we are a technology company. That's what we are driving with our digitization and our 2025 strategy. But we are also a physical structure company. So what it means is that you know if you, for example, are sitting in Papua New Guinea and you want to order something out of Beirut, you know the technology might allow you, but physically it has to be moved. Mm -hmm. And actually, you know, we are operating physically in all these countries and territories so that we have people who are dressed up like the DHL person that you will see potentially delivering some documents to you in Dubai. We have the same colleagues sitting in Papua New Guinea. We have the same colleagues sitting in Madagascar. We have the same colleagues sitting in Chile, in all the countries of the world, because we make sure that besides the technology, that the physical supply chain works, because nobody is ordering virtual goods only, yeah? So that is one thing that we do it. And, uh, and because we are operating in all these places, uh, you know, remote places, you know, closed places. So, you know, today, if you want to go to, um, to Tripoli in Beirut, or you want to deliver something in Kabul in Afghanistan, or you want to connect somebody from Kabul into Lome in, 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 uh, in, in, in Africa, in Yemen. So we can physically do it because every day we are connecting these places. And that is extremely important for the entrepreneur in Lomé, but it's also extremely important for the consumer in Lomé. For example, me, I like to wear my African clothes, but I also like to eat Lebanese food, right? Because I've been living in many different places. So, it, so for me, for my survival and my comfort, it is extremely important that I can order my African clothes from Africa, that I can eat my food that I love from Beirut, you know, while sitting in Dubai, you know? So, and that is same is applicable to many people. So I've met uh, a lot of Senegalese or Lebanese friends in Brazil, in uh, Angola. So, you know, and, and all of us, what we want to do is just to live a better life and logistics in making sure that wherever you are sitting, you can participate in global, in the global economy and live your better life. That is your option that you choose. So in essence, we are, we are connecting people and improving lives. But in detail, what it means is that we enabling consumers across the globe to be able to choose goods from wherever they want. Uh, we enabling entrepreneurs across the globe to be able to sell their goods to wherever they want. And, and that is why we have been always members of the Global Trade Alliance. It's an institution that has been uh, called upon by the World Trade Organization where we're working with governments. Um, we're working with uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, we're working with young startups to make sure that you know, all the ideas that we're gathering to make humanity live a better life are being put into practice. Great. Uh, I, thank you very much. Uh, I'll, just the last question that I'll let you answer. So how far are we from having uh, a drone or an unmanned vehicle deliver uh, everywhere? Is it five years away, 10 years away, or just to conclude, final question? So thank you. So, you know, so we have been testing drone deliveries for quite a while now. So I think we had the first pilot in drone deliveries in Germany uh, because we were trying to deliver medicine into people who were living in a small island called Halesil uh, in, in Germany, remote islands, because when you are an elderly person in Germany, you don't necessarily sort of move around and then your kids are working in the bigger cities. So, and when you need medicine, sometimes technology can be utilized. So we have been using drone technologies there. We have been doing the same thing in, uh, in Tanzania to be able to connect with hospitals that are in remote areas because there is no physical infrastructure to enable it. <laughs> but we are also doing it, you know, so for example, here in, in, in the UAE, you know, we will be working together with uh, the Dubai Future Foundation um, to try and test, you know, the tech use of tech drone technology to check whatever is in our yards for the stock taking. Uh, inventory stock taking, you know, because this is a hub for, for all of the Middle East in terms of oil and gas. So we use a, a, a lot of drone technology for many different applications, but we don't only use uh, drone technology. You know, we also have been working with uh, some of our customers to use the smart glasses so that, you know, I'm not touching the goods when I want to do the stock taking or reading the screen when I want to get the information because you can use smart glasses to go get that type of information. 
We have our supply chain division using bracelets so that they can scan without using their hands so that it is easier for them to get access to, to, to shipments. And our main division is using Effibot. Uh, so it's, these are robots that follow you when you are walking, you know, and they follow you to do delivery so that they carry the heavy load and then you just walk. Um, we have been uh, putting in place in Germany the electric vehicles, you know, for our sustainability target, which is uh, zero carbon emission by 2050. So we are innovating a lot in using electric vehicles to do our delivery. So we have roughly around 13 to 14,000 vehicles, in, you know, uh, you know, that are being used across the globe with a company called Street Scooter, which is our own um, funded and uh, created company. So we're working on a lot of different technologies. Why? Because we know that when we will become 9 billion people and that want to consume, we have to have extremely efficient logistic solutions and processes for us to be able to repeat what our predecessors have been doing since 1490, because we think that we are and we will remain the logistics company of the world. Great. Uh, Amadou, thank you so much. It was very insightful. And I think that you presented a positive view of what globalization should look like and what tech for good should, should look like. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, my honor.